Hey, Jonathan Page, an engineer working in Dr. Bill Hunt, Hunt's lab in North Carolina State University, will present a stormwater engineering perspective on research, design, and implementation of using silva cells as a stormwater control measure. Jonathan is a member of the stormwater management and low impact development teams at NCSU. His work involves implementation and applied field research of a variety of stormwater control measures. He has a BS in civil engineering and an MS in bio and ag engineering. I'm also joined by my colleague, Brenda Guglielmina, who worked with Jonathan on the projects that he'll be presenting about today. We will be recording the webinar, and a link to it will be included in a follow-up email. Attendees will be muted throughout the presentation, which should last about 50 minutes, um, and we'll have time at the end for questions. So do submit any questions at any time during the presentation using the chat box in the control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. And I will speak those aloud, and we'll have Jonathan and Brenda answer them at the end of the presentation. So with that, we'll begin. So JP, you should just have received a notification to show your screen. All right. How's that, Lita? That's perfect. Great. Well, thanks, Lita. Um, like, like Lita said, my name is Jonathan Page. I'm uh, an extension engineer uh, at NC State University in the bio and ag engineering department. I get the, get the great pleasure of working with Bill Hunt uh, and his uh, research group. Um, and over the course of the last couple of years, I've been really fortunate to work with some really good people at Deep Root, uh, like Brenda and Lita, uh, and then the Kestrel Design Group as well, like Peter uh, McDonough and Natalie Sandstrom. So I've uh, learned a lot from those folks, and um, they are certainly a big part of what I'm going to be presenting here today on uh, the research design and implementation of the soil cell suspended pavement system um, for stormwater control and treatment. To give you guys a little outline of the discussion uh, today, we're going to start with trees uh, and stormwater, what we know there, uh, and then we'll touch on a couple of things that we don't know. Then move into our experience from our research uh, with our Wilmington field monitoring sites, we'll touch on some of the uh, construction and implementation and the, the findings uh, from uh, that monitoring period there. And then we'll get into a little bit more of the design of a suspended pavement system specifically as a stormwater control measure. Um, that will include the design components and process uh, as well as a case study uh, from a set of plans in, for Person Street in Fayetteville, North Carolina. To start with what we know about trees, we've seen from city scale modeling scenarios that a larger, healthier urban tree canopy can decrease runoff volumes and improve water quality uh, through a decrease in pollutant loads. Now, the primary mechanism that we see that decrease in, in runoff volume leaving a watershed is through canopy interception, which can be as high as 36% um, of direct rainfall. But what we don't really know is what the impacts of a single street tree would be, uh, and then what the Furthermore, uh, with the impacts of a contributing drainage area and the infrastructure supporting that single street tree or urban tree would be on hydrology and water quality. Um, we'd like to, to know what the cumulative benefits of that would be, um, thinking about it specifically as a stormwater control um, and not just as uh, a part of our new uh, green streetscape. So that is really what piqued our interest um, in the silver cell system, uh, where we're able to bring together that urban tree health component uh, with stormwater management. Um, we're able to do something subsurface, beneath pavement, um, a space that may be considered underutilized um, and allows us to do some more things above ground. Now, I want to touch on bioretention for a minute, um, just to, to familiarize um, everyone with that concept, what bioretention is. Um, how it works. It's become one of the most popular uh, stormwater controls um, used in civil site design or stormwater management work, um, as well as low impact development and green infrastructure. There's a pile of literature uh, that exists on how bioretention systems function, um, you know, some of their um, uh, possible deficiencies, how to maintain them, and uh, generally how to, to design them 
uh, for targeted water quality or hydrologic parameters. And in the schematic that's shown on the screen now, uh, we have uh, all of the members of the, the water balance. We have influent runoff from a contributing drainage area. We've got evapotranspiration. We have drainage. Uh, we have infiltration, exfiltration to the underlying soil. Uh, we have our, our vegetated soil media filter. Um, now, if we contrast and compare that to what uh, the silva cell suspended pavement uh, system would, would be like and look like, uh, it's very similar. We have all the same uh, components of the water balance, um, contributing runoff, uh, we have evapotranspiration, precipitation, um, ET, uh, drainage, uh, and infiltration to our underlying soils. So I show this um, to reiterate that, that the concept here of looking at um, a suspended pavement system with a tree uh, is very similar to that or, and liken it to bioretention, where we're really taking that vegetated soil media filter and we're placing it underground uh, beneath the pavement. So that being said, you know, we, we can think about perhaps some similarities and differences between the two systems, the fire retention and suspended pavement system. Um, and in terms of water quality, what, what we know, what we, we've seen, is that the treatment processes and mechanisms uh, for that are really nearly the same. Um, however, where we do see a difference in the function between the two is going to be uh, on the hydrologic side, where our storage volume, uh, we're actually able to capture and, and detain or retain uh, a, a runoff volume for uh, a defined period of time is a little bit more limited um, simply because uh, the storage um, may not be there in a subsurface scenario. So those are the, the similarities and differences that we see. Um, but again, to reiterate that really we're taking a well-researched, well-studied uh, concept uh, and design with bioretention and we're placing it uh, beneath the pavement for a little bit different um, scenario for stormwater control and treatment and bringing together uh, that urban tree health component and, and possibly increasing some of our above ground utilization goals um, for the space. I'll begin to touch on our research sites uh, down in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, we designed two systems uh, down there specifically for stormwater control and treatment. We had runoff routed from an existing street surface uh, by installing a new catch basin and a distribution pipe um, that was conveyed to the interior of a silver cell system um, for runoff control, peak discharge mitigation, and water quality treatment. And we then monitored those two systems uh, to see what the impacts uh, of that system were, was on hydrology and water quality from inlet to outlet. Um, from there, our hope was to begin to develop some de design guidance and parameters, um, sort of some steps to follow and how we could implement these systems um, on a wider, wider range of sites. But we've learned that we have more to learn, and, and there's, there's still some additional research to be done. And fortunately, we have some of those uh, studies in place already. I'll sort of touch on those as we go. Um, but this is an ongoing process for us where we're still learning um, how to do this. And this is uh, you know, more or less our first cut but we feel like we're, we're moving along on the right track on how to use the suspended pavement system and the soil beneath pavement um, as a stormwater control measure. The study area, like I mentioned, is down in Wilmington. Uh, it's about two hours south-southeast of Raleigh, uh, which is denoted by the strutting wolf there at the center of the screen uh, where NC State is. We had two systems down there. They were installed on adjacent city blocks, uh, one at Orange Street, one at Ann Street. Um, those silver cell retrofits are shown in green, uh, and then the contributing drainage area is highlighted in the white hatch. Um, you'll notice that I'm just highlighting the directly connected impervious area. Oftentimes, that is our approach uh, to some of these right-of-way applications is to focus on the runoff volume, um, specifically from the street surface or other directly connected impervious area. Wellington specifically has very sandy underlying soil. It does not generate a lot of uh, contributing runoff. And so we feel pretty comfortable with that decision to, to focus just on that directly connected uh, portion of the drainage area. To review uh, what those contributing drainage area pro uh, properties were, um, both were, were just over a tenth of an acre, right at tenth of an acre. Our slopes were pretty flat, 2.5% uh, and 1.8%. Um, we had extremely sandy soils uh, 
beneath the systems and uh, in the contributing drainage area. So 95 and 98 percent sand. Um, virtually beach sand there, um, very coarse material, very high infiltration rates. Now to begin uh, construction of those two systems, we re removed the existing sidewalk that was in the plaza and excavated uh, the area where the silver cells would be placed. Um, from there, we brought in our aggregate layer, the first layer of frames, and then our under drains, which are shown there on the right. Uh, the PVC pipe that, that we're installing the rock collar on. Um, there were three under drains along the base of the system. You don't need three, uh, but we wanted to try to evenly distribute the drainage intensity um, across the base of the system so that we weren't over-utilizing uh, one section of the soil profile and under-utilizing the rest. Um, but you don't necessarily need three. We, uh, we just use three to more evenly distribute uh, the flow of runoff vertically through the soil profile. This is a good point to note um, uh, what we call internal water storage. Um, that creates a saturated layer within the soil profile. Um, we like it because it encourages denitrification. Um, North Carolina is an area that's very sensitive uh, to nutrient pollution. So nitrate tends to be the leading, uh, the leading parameter or, or uh, pollutant that we're concerned with. Um, so anything we can do to pr promote additional nitrate retention or total nitrate retention um, and uptake, uh, we're, we're very interested in. We feel like the upturned elbow is a good way to do that. Um, another note about uh, internal water storage is it does increase infiltration to your underlying soil. So it has a multiple uh, benefit there, both on the runoff volume and quantity reduction side, as well as water quality. Um, and the two, the two are related. Once the underdrains, the rock collar are in, we begin to, to build the system up from the ground up. We bring in a layer of soil. Um, in an eight inch lift, with then compact around the outside room, we are supporting pavements with this system, so it's really important that uh, uh, the soil around the exterior of the system is compacted and placed uh, tightly against uh, the silver cell frames. As we bring the soil up with another lift, uh, our distribution pipes are installed. And these, are, these also go in with a rock collar you can see uh, beneath them. Um, those PVC pipes are connected to an, a new catch basin that brings runoff from the street surface to the interior of the system, where it then flows vertically through the soil profile. And you can see the tree opening there uh, at the bottom left. Once the distribution pipes are installed with that rock collar, um, the silver cell decks go on, and the site will be backfilled, repaved, uh, and the tree is installed. To touch on our, um, our, our retrofit design summary for both of those sites, um, each site had about 68 uh, solar cell frames. Um, the surface area was roughly 280 feet, uh, square feet. Our soil volume was 750 cubic feet. And our loading ratio uh, at Orange Street, it was 15 to 1. And at Ann Street, it was 18 to 1. And by loading ratio, what I mean is uh, the ratio of contributing drainage area to surface area um, of our solar cell retrofit. Um, so that 15 to 1 and 18 to 1, that's, that's pretty high. Um, typically, what you will see with fire retention is 10 to 1 and 12 to 1. So with this, we were really taking a, um, a, a how much runoff can we convey to this system approach and still see an appreciable benefit. So um, their learning ratios are pretty high. We certainly acknowledge that. And we'll move through. Uh, as we move through towards um, our case study with Pershing Street, you'll see that we brought that loading ratio down a bit um, to, to something that we feel might be more appropriate. Now for our soil media composition, um, we chose to use our standard uh, required North Carolina bioretention mix. Um, that Basically what that means is the mix is going to have uh, 85 to 88 percent sand. And so I know there's, there's quite a few folks that, that come from more of a landscape architecture or urban forestry or arborist background um, would, would generally like to see a loamier soil in there uh, for the tree. But again, you know, we're, we're trying to create a balance uh, here, trying to design this particular system as a stormwater control measure. And to do that, we feel like we need to use a little bit sandier soil 
um, to pass a higher flow rate through the soil media. Um, we can touch on, on soil selection or, or sort of um, that approach at the end when we've got some time for questions. Um, and then our organic content, we did vary it at 3 and 6% um, of our soil media. <clears throat> The soil media, we, or excuse me, the organic matter that we use is a shredded pine bark or hard or, or hardwood uh, mulch and that's not been sitting for a while. We we don't like compost in our soil media filters. Uh, we tend to stay away from that and use more of a wood chip or or triple shredded mulch blend um, with our bioretention media. And, and like I said, we varied that at three and six percent um, for two reasons. One, to see if we could increase. Uh, denitrification rates within the systems, or if we saw a difference in denitrification rates within the system. And then also to go back and be able to take a look at the long-term uh, tree health, uh, whether or not that made a big difference between the two. We'll start with the hydrologic data uh, and some of the findings from our Ann Street site. At Ann Street, um, Roughly 20% of the runoff that was observed at the inlet to bypass the system. And then you recall that at Ann Street we had a pretty high loading ratio, 18 to 1. Um, and that is likely what contributed to a lot of our bypass, uh, our, our bypass issues. Um, now, even though we had about 20% of the total runoff on the bypass, we saw bypass in about 40% um, of the storms observed. Um, so there's a couple things that, that we can do to, to improve system function. One would be to create some more storage somewhere uh, within our crop section, um, and two would be to reduce our loading ratio to prevent uh, the frequency and the total volume of bypass that occurred. Now, thinking about it in terms of uh, peak discharge attenuation, uh, which is another hydrologic component uh, to stormwater control measure design, um, at Ann Street we did see a significant decrease uh, in peak discharge from inlet to outlet, about 62%. Um, and our outflow rates were very consistent. That's, that's shown by the interquartile range of the box plot on the right. Um, I will note that was for events that did not generate bypass. It was a little tougher for us to quantify what the impact was um, when we did see some bypass occur. Um, so for storms with 100% capture, we did see a significant amount of, of peak discharge attenuation. Moving into water quality and the findings uh, from both Orange Street and Ann Street there. Um, I'm showing the percent removals on a concentration basis as well as the effluent mean concentrations um, for both sites. Uh, typically, we would also include pollutant loads. Um, however, some of our hydrologic data was not really conducive to, to generating what our pollutant load numbers were. So we're going to stick with uh, concentrations and percent removals for now. I will go ahead and say that we saw a significant decrease in all of the uh, pollutants that were studied at both sites. So we saw a really, a really high level of treatment um, and pollutant retention um, at both sites. Again, we're particularly concerned with nutrients in North Carolina, so we tend to focus uh, on some of those, specifically with uh, nitrate and total nitrogen. Those effluent concentrations are really low, 0.06 milligrams per liter, 0.05 milligrams per liter for nitrate. Um, Looking a little bit closer at those nitrate concentrations, you'll recall that we did vary our organic uh, content within each system at 6% at Ann Street, 3% at Orange Street. Um, but you'll also notice that the effluent concentrations, which are shown in the blue box plots, were not all that different. Um, the medians are nearly the same. Uh, so you could say, hey, there was no difference. Um, or you could look a little bit closer and look at what our influent concentrations were, and those were very different, significantly different in fact. Um, and so we have a bit of a, uh, a confounding factor there in that uh, the type of runoff or, or the, the dirtiness of the runoff that was being applied to the system was different. Um, either way, we saw a very, uh, a very low concentration coming out uh, through the underdrain. And as a note, um, I've included that black dashed line, which is uh, the median uh, effluent nitrate concentration from our most recent North Carolina bioretention study. So we're on par with that and slightly lower uh, than what we found there. So our total suspended solids and heavy metals being copper, lead, and zinc, we saw a really high level of removal there. 
Um, also, as a note, those heavy metals concentrations are in micrograms per liter with total suspended solids in milligrams per liter. Um, again, very good treatment, um, hovering around 85 to 90 percent uh, for most of those constituents um, in very low effluent concentrations. So um, as expected with a soil media filter, um, our particulate and particulate bound pollutants are removed uh, easily and readily. Now, we think about some potential uses uh, for the silver cell system uh, and, and the suspended pavement system um, as an, a stormwater control measure. Um, I would think about a place like Durham, North Carolina. Uh, you have some, some more recent uh, watershed rules uh, with Jordan and Falls Lake there. Um, some of those require on-site uh, stormwater management. And if you're redeveloping in a downtown area, uh, or, or an existing site and you want to utilize all of it, think about it, a building that's a no setback uh, building, the only place that would be available for storage or runoff is perhaps on the roof, which may be utilized, or some other type of, of subsurface uh, storage capture treatment. Um, and so we see the, the suspended pavement system being very useful uh, in a scenario like that where um, on-site treatment is required but space is very limited. Also for Green Street redevelopment projects, um, and, and that's what I will touch on a, a little bit more with our Pershing Street case study. Uh, and then municipalities, uh, Raleigh and Durham, both have um, uh, soil volume requirements or rooting volume requirements for urban trees and street trees. Uh, so while meeting that uh, soil or rooting volume goal or requirement, you can also couple that with some stormwater control and treatment. Um, so that's where we see a lot of potential uh, for this type of, of suspended pavement system being used as a stormwater control measure. Some design considerations that we've, we've come away with from that first study down in Wilmington would include um, considering a little bit more the use of a saturated layer through internal water storage. Um, again, that means we're ponding a layer of runoff or keeping a layer of soil saturated for a prolonged period of time. And while that does increase denitrification um, because it, it makes the soil go anoxic or void of oxygen, um, and it forces more runoff to infiltrate into the underlying soil, there are some potential impacts for what soil may be available for use uh, to a large healthy tree. I am not an arborist or an urban forester, but I've learned a little bit about trees, and I know that the roots want some oxygen. Uh, and so if we're saturating that soil uh, permanently or for a longer period of time, it may not be very useful uh, to a tree and its roots. So that's just something to consider uh, with that internal water storage layer, that pr um, prolonged period of saturation that may occur within the soil profile. One of the, the big takeaways would be that pretreatment at the inlet is extremely important for, for a subsurface system of this nature, really any, any type of subsurface system. You've got a, a couple of options out there. Um, you have trash guards, uh, which is there on the left. You've got a catch basin insert or grates. And then if you want to get really serious, like the city of San Diego, you can go with the linear radial screen that can capture a, a large amount of trash, sediment, leaf litter, woody debris. Um, that type of, of thing. That said, with your pretreatment, it's also important that you maintain it. Uh, otherwise, you may end up with a scenario where you have some bypass occurring because your pretreatment device is clogged. Um, this all assumes that you have a relatively low uh, influence sediment load um, and that your watershed uh, is and remains stable over the life of uh, the device that is underground. So things to think about as we're moving into how do we actually design a suspended pavement system as a stormwater control measure, we have mostly hydrologic considerations. Um, and of those hydrologic considerations, we could say um, we're going to, to base our design decisions on a defined water quality or runoff volume, or we could say we want to safely pass or mitigate um, a specific peak discharge. I'll go ahead and tell you now that thus far we have felt like it's best to take the approach of designing 
uh, this type of system based on a defined water quality or runoff volume uh, goal. It may be difficult um, depending on your soil type, um, size of your contributing drainage area, that sort of thing, to really go the route of passing or safely passing a specific peak, peak discharge. We'll touch on that a little bit more shortly. I'm going to use uh, our uh, case study from Person Street in Fayetteville, North Carolina. This is a, a two-block uh, Green Street redevelopment project uh, where we a four-lane arter arterial street into downtown Fayetteville was narrowed down to two lanes with on-street parking, um, some street-side buyer retention areas, uh, some permeable pavement parking areas, and we included a couple of suspended pavement systems uh, in this design as well. Um, with that project, Andrew Anderson, Anderson, an office mate and colleague of mine, was the, our lead stormwater engineer, and uh, Bill Hunt was present for, for a couple of our design discussions down there, uh, leading the way um, for us uh, over, over the course of the project. So um, certainly want to acknowledge those guys that are a big part of this, um, and I'm really happy that I get to, to share some of the work that was compiled from Person Street. I mentioned we had two uh, silver cell suspended pavement systems that were designed for Person Street. Uh, they're highlighted in red there, one on the south side um, and one on the north side. We're going to focus on the north side over the course of this case study. This was a suspended pavement that was placed underneath or beneath uh, a um, permeable parking area. So the hatching is a little bit light there, but that is uh, a layer of permeable interlocking concrete pavers above our silver cell. And then we had two tree wells there uh, between the back of the curb and the sidewalk in the plaza area. Now there were a few ways that runoff was conveyed to our soil media that's contained within the silver cell. Um, first we would have, first runoff comes down the gut, uh, gutter line or, or curb um, and it flows over uh, the street surface um, and more of a street flow or a sheet flow scenario to the permeable pavers um, where it can then infiltrate or it can go through our, our flumes or curb cuts into our tree wells and infiltrate through a, an aggregate layer to the soil media or go through an overflow pipe. And I'll show a cross section uh, that goes into that in a little bit more detail. Our contributing drainage area to that system is highlighted in blue. Again, we're going to focus just on the directly connected impervious area uh, for simplicity as we walk through this. Here our contributing drainage area was about 6,800 square feet or 0.16 acres. It's 100% impervious. Again, it's just the, the street surface that's directly connected to the system. Um, and then I've got some coefficients there that we'll use um, in our calculations as we, walk, as we walk through this. Here's our cross section. Um, again, I'm going to go through how runoff goes from the street surface of the curb line into our soil media that's beneath our permeable pavers and contained within the silver cell. Uh, basic components of our cross section here, uh, we have our layer of aggregates uh, that the frames are placed on, the soil contained within, the, within those frames, uh, and then we have a layer of number two stone and number 57 stone that support our permeable interlocking concrete pavers above the decks. The runoff can flow through those permeable pavers, through the aggregate layer and into the soil media, or it can go through our curb opening, uh, curb cut flume, into an aggregate layer to the soil media that way. Or uh, and we for foresee this being perhaps one of the most utilized in terms of, of runoff volume and loading would be through an overflow and distribution pipe that's also in that tree well. And then runoff would be distributed throughout uh, the length of the soil profile. Once inside the soil cell system, it runoff flows vertically through the soil for treatment and then out through the underdrain, which is connected to the existing drainage work um, with an existing uh, junction box um, there. So as we think through uh, what the runoff volume-based design process would be, we've got a few steps. Um, to take to get there. The first is going to be to determine what our target runoff volume to control is. Um, we'll then define uh, the service area or the extent of our project, figure out how many silver cells we would need to do that beneath the pavement. 
Then we'll check what kind of storage volume we have available within our suspended pavement cross section. Um, we can adjust that storage volume within the cross section or we can increase our surface area to get to our target storage volume. And then I think it's best to consult the model. Uh, oftentimes systems that will be installed as retrofits uh, or as a right-of-way application with a street redevelopment project, they're often undersized. And so we get a lot of questions about, well, how much bypass might occur or how much overflow do you think you would have or, or how much um, complete volume reduction do you think you would get by installing a system like this? Well, the best way we can estimate that is to model it, to answer some of those questions. So I like to consult the model. Um, we can then take what we learn in the model and inform some of our design decisions that we will actually build uh, and construct. To begin, um, I mentioned we're going to figure out what our target runoff volume to control is. We have some of our contributing drainage area parameters there at the top, and we use a curve number method um, to determine how much runoff we want to store uh, within our system. In North Carolina, typically what we'll focus on in the Piedmont is, is runoff associated with a one-inch storm. In this case, that's about 450 cubic feet uh, of runoff. I do like to consider a range of storms going from a half inch up to two inches. Um, across the country, uh, depending on, on where you're at, perhaps at the federal and the state level, uh, there's been talk about using the P90 or like the 90th percentile storm or the 95th percentile storm. Uh, as your design storm. Conveniently, that equates to about an inch and a half or two inches of runoff in Fayetteville. Um, so I've included those rainfall depths and runoff volumes there as well. Once we know what our target runoff volume to capture and treat is, we can determine how we're going to store that. And so we start with figuring out what our service area is uh, for our project, what the extents will be. In this case, uh, we've got uh, a 10 and a half foot width by 53.3 uh, foot length. We do the, do the multiplication. Our service area is 560 square feet. We then determine well, how many silver cells are we going to need uh, to build a system that, that is that big. We take the dimensions of the silver cell. When they're installed, it's roughly 2.1 by 4.1 feet. Um, we divide our surface area by the surface area of the silver cell, and we come up with 65 units. And what that equates to is 65 decks and 130 frames in a two-layer system. Uh, two-layer system seems to be the most common. Um, that's what we've used the last couple of times where it hits the sweet spot of uh, not being too deep but not too shallow. Um, so that's typically what we'll go with. On a cross section, again, we'll revisit this. You've got 30 inches of soil that's contained, um, that is contained within the cell of cell. Uh, in a two-layer system, it's 32 inches tall, so that leaves us about a two-inch airspace at the top um, that we are going to claim uh, as storage for influent runoff volume. In this case, uh, also shown, we've got about a 15-inch aggregate layer above our cell of cell deck, which we're also going to claim as an area where we can store some runoff volume. I've also shown where the top of our overflow pipe is. We see that as being the maxi maximum elevation for runoff to be stored uh, within the system before some bypass would occur. Um, so we'll, we'll use that um, as the upper limit to where we can store some runoff. We have our um, lateral dimensions of 9.5 feet within our aggregate layer. Um, get the curve there. Uh, limiting that, and then we've got 10 and a half foot width uh, for our two inch airspace, which is shown there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what our unit area is for our crop section. Um, we'll start with that two inch airspace. Our unit area is 1.75 square feet. And then in our aggregate layer, our unit area where we can store runoff is 4.2 square feet. I'm using a, a 0.35 ratio for our void space there. Again, that's the number two stone. It's a pretty large aggregate um, with some number 57 on top of that. Um, that is probably a conservative estimate. It might be as high as 0.4, but uh, we are going to stick with 0.35 um, for the purpose of this 
discussion. Once we have our unit area, we multiply that by the length of our cell-to-cell -cell system, and in this case, that's 53 and a half feet. So we do that multiplication and addition to figure out what our total surface storage, and really it's subsurface storage, but um, what our total surface storage above the soil media would be. We're at 317 cubic feet. Now you'll remember our target was about 450 cubic feet. So we're a little short there. Um, but what could we do? Um, what could we do to improve that? And really the question is, so how undersized are we? We're not quite at our target. We would like to be there, but, but how are we doing? And so what we find or what we see is that we're about 70, we're at about 70% of our target runoff volume. But um, maybe you're okay ca capturing and treating um, runoff associated with three quarters of an inch of, of, of rainfall. So we're really not doing that bad um, with our first cut here. We're about 70% of our target, and if you're okay with capturing and treating runoff from, from three quarters of an inch of rain, uh, we're, we're right there. We're doing pretty well. But there's a few things we could do, or a couple things we could do, to improve our storage within the soil profile. And so we'll walk through one of those now. First, we could increase that airspace above the soil media. We can drop it down to five inches. Um, and that's shown there in the red. We still have our aggregate layer above. But if we increase that airspace, that's, again, we're going to claim that as storage volume where runoff um, can be captured and attenuated. That unit area for our new 5-inch airspace is 4.4 square feet. Um, we add that to the unit area for our uh, aggregate layer, and now we're on a total surface storage above the soil media of 458 cubic feet. If we do our design check, we are now capturing 100% of our 1-inch storm, so we're doing pretty well there. Um, for, with that simple adjustment to our design within the cross section, we can increase the amount of runoff we can capture and treat. Another option would be to simply make the system longer or wider. Uh, you get more storage that way um, by adjusting what the surface area would be. Um, I'll touch again on our internal water storage layer um, or zone with, in, in contrast to conventional drainage. Um, with our internal water storage layer, I'm showing you where that prolonged period of saturation would occur. It's about halfway up the system. We're going to saturate one layer of frames, creates about 16 inches of, of ponding. Uh, at this particular site, our underlying soils had an average KSAT uh, or saturated hydraulic conductivity of, of, five, of half an inch per hour. So it will likely drain down over time, um, but it will stay fairly wet in that bottom layer. Now the way we adjust uh, this adjust this configuration for this particular site, we have uh, the upturned elbow can be utilized or not utilized uh, within the existing catch basin. And so all we have to do is install a very simple PVC cap on the end of the pipe, and we're now functioning uh, with our internal water storage zone that creates a 16-inch layer of ponding. This is done inside an existing catch basin. This is also related to the fact that we will be monitoring this site. And so if we want the option to see how it works with and without that saturated layer, we can do that. Um, this project has been funded by the Clean Water Management Trust Fund in North Carolina uh, for construction and monitoring. Um, so that's something we're excited about uh, taking a look at, both um, with the Silva cell systems and uh, the street retrofit project as a whole. Um, we're looking forward to getting some really high quality data um, out of this site. Now, I mentioned consulting a model, and the model that I'm going to discuss is drain mod. It's originally uh, an agricultural drainage model um, that was developed by a guy named Wayne Skaggs in the Bionag Engineering Department at NC State. And it's been used uh, no, not only for modeling agricultural fields with parallel ditches, but you can also look at wetland hydrology, determine whether or not it exists. Uh, you can look at nitrogen transport throughout a, uh, a watershed. And Robert Brown, um, who is a former PhD student of Bill Hunt and is now an ORISE fellow with the US EPA, did a lot of work 
in modeling bioretention with drain mod. And he's got a paper out in the Journal of Hydrology if you want to look at that in a little more detail. That is out there and available. But again, you know, I mentioned the similarities between bioretention and then the soil media filter that we've created. Within a sil uh, suspended pavement system, we feel like it's a natural progression to then be able to use this model that's been used for bioretention to take a look at what our designs would do for a, a suspended pavement system. So I'll walk through that. So what's the drain mod really doing? Well, it's a long-term uh, continuous simulation model. It's based on historical hourly rainfall data. And it's calculating what the water table depth is within the soil profile. And it's done, that's done by, <clears throat> by going through a routine with the water balance that's shown there at the bottom of the screen. Um, it's also based on the soil water characteristic curve, which can be tough to define. But once you've done it and you have a good, good idea of what that is, it's a pretty reliable to, way to model what's happening uh, within a soil profile. Um, our output is, uh, it can be in yearly data, both cumulative and then average. I'll, I'll be presenting some average numbers or the average of a, the average annual number uh, for a 50-year um, simulation period. And this is just an example of the output that I get from, from DrainMod when I run our person street model. Uh, through our person street design through the model. You've got um, your, your rainfall infiltration, you got evapotranspiration, drainage, runoff. All of those parameters are included uh, in the output. And then I can synthesize what uh, the average outcome is based on that 50 year simulation period. And so here I'm showing our design person street with our two inch airspace. Uh, and no internal water storage zone, and with our five-inch airspace, and no internal water storage zone. Um, really, focus on the blue and the red here. Um, the blue would be infiltration to the underlying soil. Uh, that would be volume reduction. We like volume reduction. We like seeing runoff go back in uh, to the underlying soil, recharging groundwater, that sort of thing. And then the red would think of that as drainage. Uh, or, or treated outflow from the underdrains that would then be discharged back into the existing stormwater network. So it's treated outflow, but we're still sending it back in to the existing uh, storm sewer network. Now I've included our two-inch airspace design um, with no internal water storage and internal water storage side by side. Again, focus on the blue and the red. Um, we see a pretty dramatic increase in infiltration to the underlying soil with the inclusion of that internal water storage layer. And simply using that upturned elbow creates some more volume reduction, more infiltration, um, and less discharge to the existing storm sewer network. So generally, we would be excited about that. Um, in this case, we are. Uh, we did choose the design on the right to begin with um, down in in Fayetteville. I mentioned that we have the ability to change that if we want to study a different scenario. Uh, we can remove the internal water storage layer and look at it um, with the underdrains at the base, not creating that, that <clears throat> saturated layer. So it uh, shows the benefits of consulting a model to inform some of our design decisions. You know, We could have gone with a five-inch airspace, but what we learned is that using the internal water storage layer, in a two-inch airspace, you actually get more uh, runoff volume reduction, more bang for our buck with that particular configuration. Now, I mentioned designing uh, the suspended pavement system with a, a targeted peak discharge or a peak discharge attenuation goal. Well, for this site down in Fayetteville, if we take the two-year um, the two-year storm and do the calculation um, on whether or not we could pass. 90 or, or 0.93 CFS through our soil surface safely. Um, we'll we'll do we'll do the transformation or the calculation. And we learned that well, we would have to have a soil media that could pass a, a rate of 61 inches per hour, which is really high. Um, it's not unheard of, but it's really really high. Now we had a little extra time on our hands a couple years ago, and we thought, well, let's let's look into this a little bit more. Let's see what the infiltration rates or the saturated flow rates through a, a unit system with a silver cell and without a silver cell would be. 
Um, so we set this up behind a research shop. We took a look at it. You can see on this one we were able to look at it with, uh, with that upturned elbow and without. Um, and what we learned is that in a system with a silver cell, we have a little bit higher uh, uh, saturated flow rate um, at 8.6 inches per hour than what we saw in a system with no silver cell, so just standard via retention media, um, which was at 6.6 .6 inches per hour. But, but the main finding here is that that is not 61 inches per hour. Um, so again, it's best thinking through your design, uh, particularly in parts of the country where you have high intensity storms like the southeast, focus on more of a runoff volume based design. That's not to say uh, for folks that, that tend to, to live and work in the Pacific Northwest with lower rainfall intensities, longer storm durations, couldn't get a little bit closer to designing a system specifically to pass a defined discharge, uh, that it's possible. You can make it longer, you can make it bigger, but the primary, the primary component of that is rainfall intensity. And so if you have a low rainfall intensity and a large surface area, you may be able to design for a specified peak discharge. But that's not something that we tend to do in the southeast. That being said, it's important to plan for bypass. Um, so in Fayetteville, at Person Street, we've got a, a, an additional flume, uh, and, the, and the gutter line continues on through the next, um, the next landscaped island there. Uh, we don't want to create a flooding issue. Uh, this, is, this is a right-of-way. It is a street surface. Um, we do have traffic. So preventing bypass and accounting for overflow is very important in this type of design. We want to see that runoff continue on down the curve line. In the event that we get a really intense storm, um, we don't want to create uh, nuisance flooding or a safety issue for pedestrians and vehicles within the right-of-way. To summarize what our final design uh, at Person Street looked like, we had 130 silver cell frames. Um, with that design, our service area is 560 square feet, and our total soil volume was 1,400 cubic feet. Um, and then again, that loading ratio I mentioned, we brought it down to about 12 to 1, which I feel like is a little more appropriate uh, for this type of subsurface system or a little more similar to um, traditional buyer retention. And uh, we feel comfortable with that number for this particular project. Now, so what about the trees? I haven't said much about the trees yet. Well, let's, let's in our design, let's check and make sure we have uh, the correct or at least enough soil volume to support a couple of large urban trees. With our two inch airspace configuration, we've got about 1,400 cubic feet of soil volume available. And with our five inch configuration, we have about 1,260 cubic feet of soil volume. I mentioned we went with uh, the two, air, two inch airspace configuration. And with that, we have two trees uh, in two separate tree wells utilizing uh, about 700 cubic feet of soil apiece. And so, you know, ideally, I think oftentimes recommended, we would see that about 1,000 cubic feet is, is just right. But again, you know, we're balancing stormwater and urban tree health. And so we've, we're about 70% of our targeted runoff volume design. And we've got about 750 cubic feet per, of soil per tree. So we're doing pretty well meeting, meeting our dual goals. Now, a couple notes on maintenance. Um, Assuming that proper pretreatment is used um, and the contributing drainage area or the watershed that's conveying runoff to this subsurface system is and remains stable, the, the soil media within the silver cell should not require much maintenance. Now, if you're curious about what the long-term functionality of the soil would be, you can install uh, some inspection ports, and with that, pressure transducer, trans, <clears throat> transducers uh, to take a look at what those drainage rates are. Is it holding water? Is it ponding water? Um, do we have a problem, or is it continuing to function as planned? Um, that is relatively easily monitored over the course um, of the life of the project. Now, it's also really important, I mentioned this when talking about pretreatment, that sediment, trash, leaf litter, other woody debris should be removed from your catch basins and pretreatment devices, um, as well as overflow and distribution pipes. We want to keep those clean, 
All of that can be done with a back, uh, a back truck and some, uh, some, some attachments. So um, fairly easy to incorporate that into the typical municipal um, maintenance routine. Uh, oftentimes, those back trucks are readily available. I know they're highly utilized, um, but they can also maintain uh, some of the primary components of the suspended pavement system. So to summarize what our design process is, first, we're going to determine what that target runoff volume uh, is that we want to control. And we're going to check the storage uh, within our suspended pavement cross-section. Depending on what we find uh, when we check our unit area, we can adjust our cross-section. We can increase a little more uh, of the airspace for additional storage or runoff volume. We can increase the surface area, so that, would, that may be increasing the width or the length uh, of the footprint of the system to get to that targeted uh, runoff volume that we want to store. And then if possible, we can model what our selected design would be. And then based on what we learned from our model, we can inform some of our design decisions from there. Um, not absolutely necessary, but again, with undersized systems of this nature or, or in an instance where it is, it is undersized, modeling is a good way uh, to see what you're doing over the longer period of time. How, how impactful may that system be? Then confirm that you have the required soil volume that's available for your tree species. Um, that's an important component. Again, we're bringing together urban tree health and stormwater. We don't want to overlook what that soil volume requirement is, uh, particularly if you're using the system to meet a minimum soil volume requirement or rooting volume requirement. And then be sure that you account for bypass and overflow. In this case, we had an additional uh, uh, flume or curb opening that, can, that conveyed runoff on down the curb line to the next available SCM uh, or catch basin. Um, it may look differently depending on your site, but be sure to account for that, especially if it's in the right of way. We don't want to create a nuisance flooding um, or safety issue for pedestrians and vehicles. So a couple final thoughts uh, on our design at Person Street. We're at about 70% of our targeted runoff volume to control. Um, basically, three quarters of an inch of rain we can capture and treat. And we've got about 1,400 cubic feet of soil for a two, street, two tree system uh, that would each be using 700 cubic feet of soil. And so with these suspended pavement systems, it's really, it's all about balance and optimization. You know, we're bringing together stormwater control uh, and urban tree health and then space utilization. Think about this particular spot on Person Street. It's beneath a, a section of, of permeable interlocking concrete pavers, and so we get some additional parking spaces out of it. Otherwise, this, this may have been uh, or would have been uh, an above ground by retention area very similar to, to all of the other SCMs that were installed along the, along the street. So there, there's a way that we can bring all these three together and get a really high quality product. So some acknowledgments um, with this. The city of Fayetteville uh, was a great cooperator uh, when we were working on the person street designs. Um, those will be monitored. Um, and so we look forward to the data that's collected there. The city of Wilmington was also uh, instrumental in the, the first study that we did uh, at Ann Street and Orange Street. We're actually going back to those sites this spring and summer. Uh, we'll be installing some more monitoring equipment and taking a look at how those look uh, three and a half years after they were constructed and installed. So we're looking forward to getting that data collection going. NC Diener funded uh, uh, part of the research that was done in Wilmington, uh, so certainly want to acknowledge them. And then the Keshwell Design Group and Deep Roots have been really good for us to work with, um, helping us out with the technology uh, as, we, as we learn um, and develop uh, some guidance for how we can use it um, as a stormwater control. If you've got additional uh, uh, questions uh, or are looking for additional information, we've got a publication that we've submitted uh, some revisions on, and we would, we would hope and expect that that would be accepted in the very near future. So look for that in uh, ecological engineering. Um, if you, or um, you can contact me directly uh, at my email address there. So at that point, I think I'll turn it back over to Lita uh, if there are any questions.
Thanks, JP. That's that's great. And and we have a lot of questions coming in and um, only a few minutes. So maybe if you're willing, you'd, you'd stay on with us a few minutes past our originally scheduled time. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we can get to at least a few of these, if that's OK. Great. Sure um, well, let's let's jump right in. Um, as I said, we do have a lot, so I'm going to try to kind of go for the ones where I see the, the most questions coming in on these topic areas. So um, let's start uh, let's start with rainfall intensity. Uh, were you able to calculate maximum rainfall intensities that could be infil uh, infiltrated? In other words, what precipitation in what precipitation intensities resulted in bypass? Right, so that is a good question, I, and we did at one point calculate those. I don't have them in front of me now, but uh, for whoever did ask that question, if you email me, I can get you that information. Great. And um, in the same kind of design question, you, you mentioned not using compost. Is that preference uh, for not using, comp not using compost only for water quality, or is there a functional rationale as well? So we've had um, a couple of, of experiences where our organic content was a compost. It tends to export nutrients rather than retain them. Um, and I, I mentioned that in North Carolina, we're particularly sensitive to that. Um, so it's more uh, based on that experience uh, in terms of the water quality function, wanting to make sure that we are retaining dissolved nitrogen and dissolved phosphorus. Um, and that is why we usually select um, a, a shredded uh, mulch or a wood chip uh, type mix as our organic matter. OK. We also have a bunch of questions coming in about the air spaces. Can you um, speak a little more specifically about how the 2-inch or 5-inch airspace was created and adjusted sure. and varied throughout? Thanks. Yeah, so let's uh, can run up to that cross section. So within the the soil profile and the soil cell cross section, in a two layer system, you have uh, about thirty two inches of, of of depth to work with. Um, each each frame is 16 inches tall, so when we stack two frames, we get 32 inches of, of, of depth to work with. So typically, as directed on um, the, the deep root and silver cell standard details, there is a two-inch airspace between the top of the soil surface and the base of the silver cell deck. So we have, we have two inches there. Um, to work with, which means we have 30 inches of soil below that. And so in the first design configuration, I assumed that, that that's what we were going with, the standard as recommended uh, by Deep Root with the, the two-inch airspace above the soil media and beneath the silver cell deck. Um, perhaps a better picture would be of the systems that were constructed in Wilmington right here, you can see that there's still a little bit of space above the soil media before we put the decks on the frames. And so that's the airspace that I'm talking about there. Um, and then with the five-inch airspace, we would increase that. We would drop the level of soil within the profile so that we've only got 31 inches, of, or excuse me, we've only got 26 inches of soil instead of 30. So that's where we get that additional storage for runoff above the soil surface, and, and that's the airspace that I'm talking about. So if, I hope that helps. If not, again, email me, um, and I'd be happy to elaborate on that a little bit more. Great. Let's, let's talk and, about. Um, oh, go ahead, Brenda. Sorry. Well, um, and from the deep root side, um, we have tested the silver cells, and, and a six-inch airspace is what we are going to allow you, the most we're going to allow you um, to keep in there <clears throat> uh, for structural reasons. And that's going to therefore give you six inches of, of ponding depth, if you want to call it that, or airspace. Um, I guess that's a, when I think about a traditional bioretention, I think about the word ponding space as um, you know the space above the soil that you can actually do some water storage. 
So it's a good way to think about it. Anything to add okay, to that, JP, before we move on? No, I think Brenda did a very good job on that one. It, okay. it, would be, it would be more appropriate to think of it as ponding depth in comparison to buyer retention. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, JP, can you speak to what happens to suspended solids and heavy metals after they're pulled out of the effluent? If they remain in the planting media, is it necessary to treat or replace the media once levels of those compounds you know, exceed a certain level or reach a certain level? Sure. I think there are there are varying opinions on that, and it it really depends on what your influent uh, heavy metals or suspended solids concentrations and loads would be. Um, that can if you assume a load and assume what you think the annual volume would be or the volume over the lifetime of, of the project, um, you can you can determine uh, what that is and get an idea of whether or not it should be changed. You can also monitor for it with a riser or inspection port. You know, collect a sample uh, from the soil and figure out whether or not it's too polluted, um, too polluted, or or is just fine. Um, I don't know, and, and I've, I've had a very short career so far, um, so, but I don't know that I've been around any bioretention cells even where we have changed out the media because we felt like it had been uh, saturated, so to speak, by heavy metals and suspended solids. In, and in your thing, then. Hmm. Sorry. No, go ahead, Brenda, please. No, I'm curious, you know, because that's a, 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 probably a likely next question is, because I'm starting to hear that too, where, you know, it's a lot longer than we used to think that these fire retention systems can function before they do need to be. Um, changed. So I'm just curious how long you've been monitoring some of the systems. Like what are the longest ones? So some of the longest ones, I think if we went back to Bill's, so Bill had a, a site over in Chapel Hill, North Carolina that he studied, I would say 15 plus years ago um, as part of his PhD work. Um, you know, visually it appears to be functioning well. It drains well. It does not appear to be clogged, but I can't say um, what the quality of the runoff is coming out of the under drains. Now, I, I want to say I've seen a couple of papers in the peer-reviewed literature where, where this has been looked at in greater detail, so I would encourage um, those folks that do have lingering questions about that to search there, because I don't necessarily have a specific um, instance that I can speak on. Okay. Can you speak, JP, a little bit about how um, the pollutant levels of outflow were measured? Sure. So we used um, flow paste uh, water quality samplers, um, Teledyne Disco units, um, 6712. Uh, we had V-notch we, uh, weirs and weir boxes at the inlet um, to the system. It was in front of our pretreatment device, uh, and then we had um, some uh, monitoring equipment at the under drains. Uh, so we were sampling what what type of uh, or what the quality of the runoff was coming directly out of the under drains, the volume of that, measuring it with our V-notch weir, um, and then collecting those flow paste samples, um, composited flow paste samples um, from the inlet and outlet at both sites. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then we we have really been talking a lot about. Uh, Stormwater, obviously, um, but let's wrap up our last question um, with one about the tree. Uh, you know, you talked a lot about soil volume, um, which is great, Brenda. So maybe you can speak to this last question of um, what is the anticipated impact of 700 cubic feet of soil for the trees, um, particularly with a, a bioretention mix rather than a loam mix? Um, you're asking me? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just a little bit about what we can do for the tree here, since we've really been talking only about the water and the soil. Right, right. And I mean, that is one of the, the beauties of the silver cell system is that you can balance. I know that JP's been talking a lot about balance. Is that you can balance your soil media to both 
take care of the tree and take care of stormwater. Um, obviously, still more research being done, but um, if you wanted to, say, add more clay or more loam or whatever to your soil mix in order to um, keep water around a little bit longer or have that water and, and the nutrients from the soil available for the tree, um, those are those are choices that you can make. Um, I would say for those people who have asked that question, if you want to get a hold of of someone at Deep Root, myself, um, we can get some answers on specific tree species or soil mixes that have worked well. Um, many of you know James Urban, and he's helping us with our soil spec. We are actually coming out with a, a brand new soil specification that should be a little bit easier to um, impl implement. And uh, so, yeah, for those who've asked more specifically about the tree, get a hold of either Lita or myself, and um, we'll get you a good soil spec so that you're doing both those things, the soil, um, the, the bioretention, and, and the best soil for the tree species that you're looking at. Thanks. Hopefully that. that answers the question, or you can. Yeah, answer no, thanks. I I know we're, we're there are way more questions than we can get to, um, and we've gone over time. So I do want to wrap up for today. But to echo what both Brenda and JP have said, please feel free to reach out to any of us after the webinar is over. Um, JP's uh, email is on the screen. Uh, Brenda, some of you may know already, it's Brenda at deeproot.com. My email address is lita uh, at deeproot.com, and you can also reach me just by replying to the follow-up email that will go out um, tomorrow. So um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. A link to the recording will go out in that same uh, follow-up email I just mentioned. It will also be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, and we will also include a link to JP's presentation today, where you can go download it and um, move through the slides again and, and share it with colleagues. Um, so you can find more information about Deep Root on our website or on our blog. And uh, JP, a huge thanks. Thank you so much for uh, your time and your presentation today. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Lita.